Hello everyone and greetings from Austin, Texas, the musical capital of the world. My name is Slobodan Vujicic, I am the director of the group Austin Troubadours and uh, we research and perform uh, the Renaissance music of the European tradition. We use the authentic replicas of musical instruments and follow the laws of the what's called the historically informed uh, performance and we try real hard also to break those laws sometimes. So we'll talk about the musical instruments and this presentation is supported by the Cultural Arts Division of the Department of Economic Development of the City of Austin. We are really grateful to these folks that have been supporting us for years. We'll divide this uh, presentation in, in sections. We'll talk about the plucked string instruments and wind instruments and bowed string and percussion. And you will visit our homes and, and, and our studios where each person will talk about his own instruments. So let's hop on the magical carpet and go. The first station is actually my studio where I'll talk about the, the plucked string instruments, including the harpsichord, which is really a lute in disguise. I will start with the plucked string instruments. There are several here. Um, and this one I would like to introduce first. It's called the oud. And it's a very interesting instrument. It has a, a, a few really important things to, to kind of know about it. Uh, it's, a, it's an instrument that's made of wood. And you can say, of course, what else? But the, uh, the early drawings of wood come from a uh, ninth century. So it's 1100 years ago. And strangely enough, they were kind of almost the same like this one. It didn't change at all over all these years. And it's pretty much live well and well in the in the um, uh, music tradition in, in Middle East today as it is it was then. And um, because it was made of wood, it was invention because the instruments before that were made out of some kind of a animal skin stretched across the wooden frame. But someone thought, oh, maybe s solid wood will, will sound better. And indeed it does. It has a very deep sound. So we'll play a little song for you uh, that's an early medieval song. It's called Canzonetta Tedesca. And a lot of instrumental music of that time was um, mainly improvised. So what I have in writing is like eight measures of the, of the theme. And the rest you have to make up. Uh, and that's fun. That really is fun, especially for us classically training musicians that we were just always used to just play the notes. Now this, you can do whatever you want. You know, it, it is fun. And Oud has uh, its best friend. Uh, it's called the Saz. They're always traveling together. Saz is a relatively simple instrument. It's got uh, three wire strings and was used mainly to accompany singers and instrumentalists as holding the drum. So um, we'll do this little dance.
show you something it's hard to get it but see the label it was made by a one of the best wood makers in the world Ibrahim Shukar and if you look at the label it's kind of a different culture you know how these labels uh, that uh, people that make lutes and, and, and uh, Tiorbos they have very delicate and so this guy has his own picture uh, and his cell phone number and <laughs> His email inside. It's real funny, but it's a really good instrument, though. Okay, so uh, how is that related to the Renaissance instruments? Well, this instrument is actually the the um, father of this instrument, and this is the most popular instrument. It's called the Renaissance lute. This is my pride. It's made by L lutenist Cesar Mateus, who was. Uh, one of the, who is, he lives in New York, he's one of the probably two or three best lute makers in the world. And I was so fortunate to, to jump in front of the line. His line is about four to five years. Uh, so I got it recently, I'm very happy about that. So the lute is the instrument uh, that was the really king of the, all the Renaissance instrument. It was probably the most popular and um, But it was developed from the oud. Oud came to Europe during, during the times of crusaders, and uh, European troubadours uh, and, and the music of that time started to be polyphonic. So oud was strictly for monophonic music and was using this thing. It's called a risha. So the European troubadours decided to throw it away. And um, they started playing with fingers. They added more strings. They put a frets and how that's how the renaissance lute was born and i'm talking about plug string instrument and you can you're wondering what is this thing doing here <laughs> it looks like a piano is, it, is that a piano nelly no it's not piano what is it harpsichord it's a harpsichord okay well i call harpsichord sometimes a lute in disguise because the way the you produce the the sound on harpsichord is really kind of similar like on the lute when Nelly depresses the key, there is a lever that goes uh, to engages this thing. It's called the jack, harpsichord jack. And let me see if I can make you see that. See that little white thing at the, at, the, at the tip of it? It's like a quail. It's like a guitar pick almost that plucks the string. And this red thing stops the string on the way back. So the thing is that you cannot play loud or soft on the harpsichord. It's impossible. You play the strings one way and, you know, uh, because of that, harpsichordists were forced to come up with a way to compensate for that. So they were adding a lot of ornaments, a lot of uh, divisions, uh, grace notes to it. And they would play, now can you show something, like if they have a chord progression like this, for example, simple chord progression the harpsichordist would not play like that he would come up with uh, some you know embellishments to that okay okay can you see that sounds kind of cool right um, and I will play a small duet uh, written for the lute and the uh, lute in disguise. It's called La Rossignol, which means the nightingale. So one of the favorite things of Renaissance composer is imitating uh, uh, sounds of nature. So listen to the bird's call.
you'll hear that a lot. So let's share the screen once again. That was a little duet, duet. and uh, I only have a couple of more minutes, so I will quickly go over a couple, just show you a couple of instruments that, that uh, I also have. Uh, this is the first instrument that's actually had the name guitar in the title. At that time, they called it guitar. Now we call it Renaissance guitar. It sounds kind of like a ukulele. It's tuned like the guitar one fourth up. And then another one, and that'll be the last one I'll show you, is this. This here we are getting closer to the modern guitar. If if there are any classical guitarists that want to take up this early instrument, this will be the first step. Because it's called Baroque guitar, it's played with fingers or oftentimes strumming. And it has the, exactly the same pitch and same tuning as the modern guitar without a six string. And I only have a little time to uh, show you something. So uh, I had to uh, uh, I had to invite my uh, brothers, four of them, to play along with me, <laughs> and. Uh, We'll have all these instruments playing one last tune together, and then we'll turn it over to Victor.
So, okay, I think this is all from the Wiesage household. And uh, please step on our magic carpet and fly to Northwest Austin, where we'll meet and greet Mr. Victor Acolt, the Renaissance man. He has a degree in music, but he's also a research scientist at the University of Texas. He's also a great dancer. So many, many different <laughs> faces that he has, and he'll show us some of that. Victor, your turn. In the Renaissance, music was predominantly vocal. In this illustration, we see four musicians, one singer and three recorder players performing a piece of music together. They all play a melody line and the recorder players probably uh, had lyrics on their lines because the music could be performed with either four vocalists, one vocalist and three recorder players, or even four recorder players. But basically the music was vocal in character. Well, you may know that there are soprano, alto, tenor and bass singers. And so if you want to perform this vocal music with recorders, you also need similar instruments. So the recorder that everyone learns in school is a soprano recorder to be technical. Just like that there are sopranos and alto singers, there is then an alto recorder, which is lower in pitch. Soprano alto tenor, and here is a tenor recorder. Soprano alto tenor bass. And here we have a bass recorder. So if you have four of these recorders and you have a couple of friends, then you can take a piece of Renaissance vocal music and perform it with a recorder quartet. A very satisfying experience because a lot of this is very sonorous music by our notions. Now I said that these were soprano, alto, tenor, bass recorders, but they are actually, if you measure the pitches, an octave above uh, soprano, alto, tenor, bass singers. So if you want to reproduce the, vo the sound of a vocal quartet exactly, then you need to start with a tenor recorder for the soprano line, a bass recorder for the alto line, the tenor recorder is played on this four foot long monster called a great bass recorder. And finally for the bass singer you need this pipe which you can see is taller than I am. Very hard to display, but here it goes. So that's six feet and a bit, of, a bit more at the bottom and at the top. This illustration um, from Pretorius illustrates that people indeed had all these instruments and uh, used them for consort playing.
While it is still common these days to see multiple sizes of recorders, other instruments are these days limited to one or maybe two sizes. If you think of a flute, then everyone knows about the normal concert flute and you, you probably know about the piccolo, which is an octave higher. But going back to the Renaissance, flutes also came in soprano, alto, tenor, bass sizes. So this is an alto sized flute. This is a tenor size. And then this is a bass flute. Now again, it's called a bass flute, but it's really in the range of an alto singer. Finally, reed instruments. They also came in families, but not only don't, don't we know these families anymore, we actually don't know the whole instruments anymore, unless you're very seriously into, into early music. So for instance, this is called a crumb horn, a bent horn. And you may not believe it looking at it like this, but it's a reed instrument as I will show in a minute. Uh, this is a tenor crumb horn. They also come in alto soprano, bass, great bass, and they sound like this. <laughs> So that's a crumb horn. Then there is a chalumeau, there is a dulcian, which is like an early bassoon, there is a doucen, and then there are various instruments that are um, much louder sounding. They are part of what we now call the loud band. And rumor has it that there was a law against playing this instrument indoors because it is so loud. So I won't demonstrate it. It's called a Rausch Fife. It is extremely loud. And this is a cap, this is a cap, just like with the crumb horn, and I've taken the cap off, and you can see that there is a double reed here. But unlike the modern oboe, this reed does not go between your lips. You put the cap on it, and then you blow into the cap. Finally, the most bizarre instrument, it's a German instrument. Um, this is called a racket. It's uh, not terribly big, so you may think it's kind of high sounding. Well, it's not. It also has a nickname of a sausage bassoon. Why sausage? Well, Inside this, t inside this enclosure is a wound up tube that is actually as long as the tube of a bassoon. It's just completely wound up. And that is why this instrument actually sounds fairly low. <laughs>
I'm going to take you on a quick tour through the history of the bowed string instruments as they evolve into the instruments of the Renaissance and then on into the modern instruments that we use today. Although there are many different kinds of amazing instruments that surface throughout time, I'm just going to talk about the most common ones and the ones that were probably used the most. And of course, these are the ones that I had. I'll start with the earlier instruments and work my way up. This instrument is called the rebec. It probably comes from the Arabic rabab. This one has three strings. They take a piece of wood, one piece of wood for the back, shape it, hollow it out, glue a piece of wood onto the top, the soundboard. They add a fingerboard and add a bridge. The strings go across the bridge so that you can bow it that way. It was probably the most popular during the 13th through the 16th centuries, and there are forms of it that are still used today. From the Rebec, the instruments start becoming a little bit more refined. This instrument is called the VL, which is also a medieval fiddle, just like the Rebec. The VLs tend to have four to five strings and are tuned in different ways. Instead of being carved from one piece of wood, they make all the different parts and then glue them together. This one has four strings and the top is flat and the back is flat and in pieces and they glue them to the sides to make the instrument. And then again, they have a fingerboard and a bridge and the strings go over the bridge. We know from paintings and drawings that the instruments came in all different sizes and were played in all different ways too. This one sounds like this. This is another VL. It's a little bit smaller than the other one, and this one has five strings. And although it has a flat back, it's a little bit more developed because it has a curved top, more like the modern violin that has a curved top and a curved back. As I said before, they were played in different ways. From the paintings, we know that they came in different sizes. And we have them holding the instruments down here. Sometimes they hold it up on the arm. Sometimes they'll hold it up on the shoulder. I'm going to play it up on the shoulder. Then from the medieval period, we move into the Renaissance period, where the instruments evolved into the viola de gamba sometimes called gamba or even vial. Gamba means you hold it with your legs. It was really popular for about 300 years from around 1480 to 1780. They have six strings and they're tuned in fourths, the third in the middle. And if you look closely, you can see that it's got frets on it, kind of like the guitar. But these frets are tied on, more like the lute, because the lute's frets are also tied on. They come in a family of instruments, just like the violin family. The violin family has the violin, the viola, the cello. And this has the treble viol, which is the smallest, plays the highest parts. The tenor viol, which is a medium size and plays the middle parts. And the bass viol, which plays the bass parts or the little parts. The bow also looks a little bit different, it's a little bit more refined. It's not quite so curved this way. And it also has a screw here that you can tighten and loosen the horse here, which is the white stuff here. I'm going to play a little bit on this triple dial, and this one is more of an example of an early Renaissance instrument. It has more of a guitar shape than the viola da gamba shape, and it sounds like this.
Although they had different sizes of viola de gambas in between sizes, the main ones, the treble, the tenor, and the bass were the most popular. They also had one that was really large, the size of a double bass. It was called the violone. It did have six strings also. Played in the range of the modern double bass. In fact, the modern double bass is a member of the viola de gamba family to this day. The bass file like this one became the big solo instrument of its time before the end of the popularity of the viola de gamba. They added a seventh string. So. It goes down below the range of the cello. I'm going to play the same song that I played on the triple viol just to show you the difference in the sound. It sounds like this. The popularity of the viola de gamba was not to last. The violin family slowly pushed out the gambas during the Baroque period, with the violin becoming the big solo instrument of the day as the musical demands changed. The bass gamba held out the longest, but the cello finally took over its position. This is the Baroque cello. It's got four strings, like the modern violin, and it's tuned in fifths. Uh, the neck is shorter, the fingerboard is shorter, the bridge is not as tall, has less tension, it's not quite as loud, and it has no end pin. You hold it like the gambas with your legs. I'm gonna play a little bit of unaccompanied Bach, and it sounds like this. <laughs> we finally end up with a modern cello. It has a longer neck, longer fingerboard, the bridge is taller, and it's tuned a half pitch higher. Uh, it uses synthetic or steel strings as compared to all the other instruments they use gut strings made of sheep gut. Everything is to make it louder. It also added an end pin which holds the instrument up, helps the player to play a little bit easier. And I'm going to play a modern piece from the movie Pirates of the Caribbean. It's a cello solo that was in that, that movie. And it sounds like this. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Oliver Rajmani. And uh, I'm going to speak to you all about some percussive instruments which have been used in old uh, European music. And they have a very interesting history. So the first instrument I'm going to speak about is uh, commonly known as the frame drum. Uh, now the frame drum's history goes back uh, thousands of years. In fact, it's considered to be one of the first uh, drums where humans took a piece of skin and stretched it around uh, wood. And this instrument is uh, was traditionally played as a shamanic uh, healing uh, instrument used in a lot of healing ceremonies and it's still used that way in many uh, old cultures. Um, this in particular instrument is called a def in uh, spelled D-E-F in the Middle East and India. Uh, we have the Irish Bodran um, and uh, this instrument is found pretty much in every culture and um, I'm going to play this instrument for you all and I um, so you can hear how it sounds so as you can tell uh, there's a lot of finger uh, technique used to play this drum, but it's also used, um, uh, they use sticks to play <coughs> this drum also in certain regions. Now this drum made its um, entry into Europe a um, long, long time ago, 
from the Middle East in many different ways through uh, uh, the Arab conquest of Europe, um, as well as other uh, ways of trade and so forth. So this uh, instrument has been in Europe for a long time, uh, used in um, traditional old uh, European music. Now, uh, the next instrument I'm going to show you all is again kind of like a frame drum, but just smaller. And uh, if you look at this drum and I ask you what this is called, you would say tambourine, which could be correct, but actually this is called a rik, spelled R-I-Q-Q. -Q. Now the rik is um, the origins to all of tambourine, and it comes from the Middle East. And it has um, a very interesting technique of playing. It's complex uh, technique of finger techniques um, using the jingles here as well as the skin. So it goes like this. Now this instrument is played in many, many different ways. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's used with fingers and, you know, obviously out in the West here. Uh, you can hear people shaking it, or even playing it like this. Um, so, uh, you know, it's been a very common instrument throughout uh, the world, but its origins come from the Middle East, and uh, it arrived in Europe. Uh, also, uh, similarly as the frame drum did um, through Arab conquests and trade and so forth, so it's been uh, used in old European music for uh, centuries. Now, uh, I'm going to show you another instrument here. Uh, this is a drum. Um, now, uh, this is called the Dumbek. It's a Middle Eastern drum. And you can see in old uh, European paintings, uh, drums like these. Traditionally, they were made uh, of clay uh, with a fish skin stretched out. But the fish, which is called the Nile Sturge, is extinct today. So it's... Um, can be used, but uh, now today they use goat skin and synthetic. And this also is from the Middle East, which entered Europe um, many hundreds of years ago, and uh, has a nice uh, finger technique sort of playing. Now I'm going to show you uh, another now I'm going to show you another interesting instrument. Um, these are called, uh, called clappers traditionally. Clappers were actually wooden wooden or bone flat, uh, uh, polished down flat, and they were used in old Europe to keep a rhythm for music, or uh, sometimes lepers used them to let people know, you know, they would hit them and people would know that they were a leper. But here we have castanets, and uh, these are um, traditionally used. These are uh, very old instruments, go, go back to the ancient Roman times. And uh, in Spain, they used um, in flamenco, but a lot of people associate castanets with flamenco. Um, and that is a very much later addition um, to flamenco. Traditionally, uh, flamenco music, which uh, came from the gypsy community or Romani community of um, Spain, um, was considered uh, very outcast music uh, by the Spaniards. Uh, they did not accept that music. And later on, the Spaniards high society started creating a fascination for this. And, um, and then the uh, Romani uh, community started performing for the Spaniards. And, and through that, a lot of traditional um, Spanish folk songs and traditions were included later on into flamenco through the Romani community and interpreted by the Romani community. And, um, and so uh, flamenco ended up including all those traditions as well. And that's where uh, uh, castanet can come in because castanets were used in old uh, folk uh, Spanish uh, songs. And uh, so a lot of times when you hear flamenco and uh, uh, class the nets in flamenco, uh, it's uh, from a older uh, folk Spanish tradition. And it's played in many different ways uh, with using fingers and so forth. 
Now I'm going to speak about the last instrument, called, uh, which are known as bells. Now bells have been traditionally used, they've seen, been seen as a very special uh, instrument in European music. They were used uh, as a way to keep um, evil spirits away. So a lot of times bells were even stitched onto people's clothes and uh, churches used bells. And the chimes, um, which I have here, the chimes were seen as the most uh, ethereal, angelic, heavenly instrument in Europe and they held a very special place in European music. And uh, so uh, uh, they were used in um, all the uh, biblical um, preachings and church music and all that. So um, interesting uh, instruments here. So, uh, so this concludes my um, uh, little speech here about the percussion instruments of old Europe. And I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you very much. Again, my name is Oliver Ajman. Thank you. Thank you all for attending this, this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you maybe learned something. Uh, some of these instruments are really unique, hard to find. I'm very proud that Austin Troubadours has probably one of the richest uh, uh, collection of the of the musical instruments, certainly in the state of Texas. Uh, so, in the meantime, let's keep in touch. You can visit our face, Facebook page for up to date date uh, information about our performances. You can get our CDs on iTunes or Amazon, and hope to see you soon in person. Let's hope that uh, 2021 will be a better year and that. We'll be able to come to your town, play, and hug you after the concert. Thanks again.